Welcome to Access for All. I am your host, Robert Gorski, and along with Access for All team members, Wheelchair Boy and the Stone of Truth, I will talk with you about the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA for short. On this program, we will continue unpacking how Title I of the ADA protects people with disabilities from employment discrimination based on disability. The title of this program is, I'm Accommodating, Are You? I'm going, however, to begin by thanking viewers who sent in kind and generous remarks about the show. The Access for All team is very grateful. Also sent in was a question. <clears throat> Does the ADA protect people with disabilities on commercial airlines? The answer to the question is both yes and no. Yes, because Title I covers any airline employee who flies or serves passengers if the employee has a disability that meets the ADA definition. And remember from our previous show that the ADA definition includes an employee who is regarded as having a disability or has a history of disability, but in all cases is qualified for the position. The answer to the question from the viewer is also no, because no part of the ADA covers airline passengers with disabilities. But airlines are not free to discriminate against passengers on the basis of disability. That is because another federal law called the Air Carriers Access Act, ACAA for short, protects passengers with disabilities, and it is enforced by the Federal Aviation Administration. Now, Wheelchair Boy thought this question was a good chance to review how different sections of the ADA cover different parts of community life. To illustrate this, he came up with an admirably complicated hypothetical scenario called what covers when. Let's start by supposing a woman with a disability and with a mobility impairment that meets the ADA definition of disability has vacation reservations in Cabo San Luis. While she sits in her apartment waiting for a ride to arrive, she is not covered by any part of the ADA. But she does have some protections under the 1988 amendments to the Federal Fair Housing Act. If her home is a condo, the ADA covers the homeowner association and that affords her some protections from discrimination based on disability. Now suppose the woman has a ride scheduled with her town's dial-a-ride to take her to a light rail station. When arranging for and riding on dial-a-ride, the woman will be covered by Title IIA because the service is a part of her local government and Title IIA covers local government. But an hour before the scheduled pickup, she learns that the dial ride vehicle broke down and a backup vehicle will be late getting to her residence. The woman calls Access Services and arranges a ride to the rail station. While arranging for and riding on Access Services, the woman is covered by Title IIB. While she waits on the public sidewalk for the arrival of Access Services, the woman is covered by Title IIA because the sidewalk is a service of her local government. Now when the woman gets to the light rail station and while she rides the light rail, she is covered by Title IIB because light rail is part of the public transit system. When the woman arrives at a light rail station near the airport, she boards the shuttle bus to the airport terminal. Because the bus is run by a private business, the woman is covered by Title III of the ADA, which covers everything in the private sector. When she alights from the bus onto the sidewalk outside the terminal, 
and while walking through the terminal, the woman is covered by Title IIA because the airport is operated by an authority set up by local government. Nevertheless, while being served by airline ticketing and boarding staff, she is also covered by Title III because the airline is a private business. Now, if the woman steps into an airplane, she is covered, as we learned previously, by the Federal Air Carriers Access Act. But in this hypothetical illustration, the woman gets into the airport terminal and then realizes she actually has tickets already purchased on a cruise line to Cabo San Lucas. Quickly, she exits the terminal, hails a taxi cab to get her to the ship terminal. While arranging for and riding in the cab, she is covered by Title III because taxis are a private business. When the woman exits the cab at the airport, she is covered by Title IIA because the port is operated by an authority established by a local government. Before boarding her ship, the woman calls her friend who is deaf. To do this, she first contacts the phone company's TTY operator. This operator uses a telephone equipped with a TTY machine to type a call to the woman's friend. When the friend answers by typing on his or her TTY machine, the operator acts as an intermediary between the hearing person and the friend who is deaf. This communication service is required by Title IV of the ADA. While on board the ocean liner, the woman is covered by Title III because, you guessed it, the ship is run by a private business. She is covered by Title III even while in international waters and while sailing in Mexican waters. But when the woman disembarks, she is no longer covered by the ADA or any other American law on accessibility. Now, wheelchair boys searched the internet for accessibility law in Mexico and found there is a law that generally mandates inclusion of people with disabilities into Mexican society. But there was nothing that suggests the law has the level of practical detail in any way similar to the ADA. If any viewer has pertinent information to share on this topic, please do so by email address to accessforall at yahoo.com. A viewer, uh, any viewer who would like, a, uh, like to quiz friends or colleagues on the complex illustration that I just outlined, you may request a copy of both the graphic and the text by emailing accessforall at yahoo.com. Now, let's switch to Title I of the ADA and what employers need to do to avoid discrimination based on disability. Now, Wheelchair Boy advised me to show today's keyword early in the show rather than near the end. Therefore, following his advice, here is today's key word, reasonable accommodation. Uh, the previous show, the previous program, ended with a question and answer format, and we will continue in that manner. After each question, I will give viewers a moment to think of the answer, and then let the stone of truth indicate the correct answer. If the stone heats up, the answer is yes. If it remains cool, the answer is no. So far, we have done questions one through nine. Let's continue with questions 10 through 12. Question 10, can an employer refuse to implement a reasonable accommodation requested by an employee or a job applicant with a disability? Okay, the stone is heating up. The answer is yes. But here comes a long explanation for the yes. The employer must make a good faith effort 
to discuss the matter with the employee. Remember the previous program? Keyword was interactive process. Interaction between employer and employee or applicant with a disability is required by the ADA because the individual with a disability can frequently, but not always, suggest an appropriate accommodation. Sometimes an employer can identify a more effective accommodation. But the principal test for agreeing to an accommodation is, will it enable the person with a disability to perform the essential functions of the job or application process without an undue hardship for the employer. Now, it need not be the best accommodation or the accommodation the, invi the, invi the individual with a disability prefers, although primary consideration should always be given to that preference. Still, the employer has the discretion to choose between effective accommodations and may select one that is less expensive or is easier to provide. In any case, an employer should never, never, never say no at first. And don't say no until you have gone through the interactive process with the employee or applicant. And still, don't say no at the end of the process unless you can justify the no with clear, factual reason to deny an accommodation. Finally, document the request, the process, and the reasons for denial. Question number 11. Is reassignment to another job a type of reasonable accommodation? Okay, the stone is heating up again. The answer is yes. When an employer with a disability is unable to perform, oh, I'm sorry, let me, when an employee with a disability is unable to perform his or her person present job even with a reasonable accommodation, an employer must consider reassigning the employee to an existing position that the person can perform with or without a reasonable accommodation. But employers are not required to create a position or to bump another employee in order to create a vacancy. Also not required is promoting an employee with a disability to a higher level position. Let's go continue with question number 12. Is providing additional insurance for employees with disabilities required? The stone is cold. The answer is no. The ADA only requires that you provide an employee with a disability equal access to whatever health insurance coverage is provided to other employees. For example, if an employer's health insurance coverage for certain treatments is limited to a specified number per year, and an employee with a disability needs more than the specified number, the ADA does not require providing additional coverage. Also, the ADA does not require changes insurance plans that exclude or limit coverage for pre-existing conditions, so long as the other employees have the same limitations. Equal quality of access and benefits is required. Let's continue with the next set of questions, 13 through 15. Question 13, can an applicant or employee refuse an accommodation that employer offers? And the answer is yes. An employer cannot require a qualified individual with a disability to accept an accommodation. But an applicant or employee who refuses the author, offer of an effective accommodation and then is unable to perform essential tasks of the hiring process for assigned work may be liable to be assessed as not qualified for the position sought or currently held. 
Question 14. Is an employer required to make its, access, its facilities accessible? And the answer is yes, but it's a yes but. The employer must make its facilities accessible to qualified applicants and employees with disabilities as a reasonable accommodation, a reasonable accommodation, unless that would cause undue hardship. On the other hand, there is no requirement to make facilities accessible in advance of a request that a hypothetical employee might make in the future. Nevertheless, <clears throat> when an existing facility that houses employees is altered or a new facility is built, it is certainly prudent to incorporate architectural accessibility into that alteration or new construction. <clears throat> Question 15. If a business has a health spa in its facility, must it be accessible to employees with disabilities? Again, the answer is yes. Employees with disabilities have the right to equal access to all benefits and privileges of employment that are available to similarly situated employees without disabilities. The employer's duty to provide reasonable accommodation applies to all non-work facilities provided or maintained for employees. This includes cafeterias, lounges, auditoriums, company-provided transportation, and counseling services. If making an existing facility accessible would be an undue hardship, the employer must consider providing a comparable facility that is accessible. Now, the last set of questions. <clears throat> Question 16. A business hires a consultant to give employee training at a hotel that is inaccessible to one of the business's workers. Is the business liable for discrimination under the ADA? And the answer is a definite hot yes. An employer may not do through a contractual or other relationship what is prohibited from doing directly. The location for training must be readily accessible to and usable by an employee with a disability unless to do so would create an undue hardship. Question 17. Does the ADA require posting a notice explaining Title I requirements? Well, the answer is yes. Further, the notice must be in a format accessible to applicants, employees, and members of labor organizations. The Equal Opportunity Employment, e Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC for short, can provide employers with a poster summarizing these and other federal legal requirements for non-discrimination. The EEOC will also provide guidance on making this information available in accessible formats for people with disabilities. Final question, number 18. If I am in compliance with the employment provisions of the ADA, is that all I need do to avoid discrimination based on disability? Well, the answer is yes, but it's one of these yes but answers. The stone of truth is moderately worn because there may be state employment discrimination laws that apply to your business. For example, while the ADA has bans employment discrimination based on disability, in businesses with 15 or more employees, comparable California law applies to businesses having as few as five employees. Also, if you are a federal contractor, there may be affirmative action requirements in other federal laws uh, which with, with which you must comply. One such law is Section 503 of the Rehabilitation Act. 
In today's questions about Title I of the ADA, there's been much reference to reasonable accommodation. Now, the second half of this two-word phrase is really easy, relatively easy to understand. An accommodation is any change in the work facility, the work process, or the employment policies, benefits, and privileges that allows a person with a disability to achieve or improve job or application performance. <clears throat> but the leading word reasonable gives some employees heart palpitations. What does the ADA say is reasonable and what is not reasonable? Does a construction company, for example, have to hire a blind person to operate a crane? Very likely not. Nevertheless, if an applicant meets the job description criteria of qualifying job experience, past training and licensing, and the job description accurately describes the physical and communication skills that are essential for the job, you need to treat that applicant as you would others who meet the criteria. If a qualified applicant comes to the job in interview and has impaired vision, the ADA allows the employer to question how the applicant will perform various job functions safely. If the applicant says all he or she needs to perform the job safely are a few tactile labels on the crane handles, that should be considered a reasonable accommodation. But if the applicant asks for another employee to assist in operating the crane, that would probably be unreasonable no matter the size of the business. Another example, a person who is hard of hearing appeal, appear, applies for a clerical position. Does the employer have to hire a sign language interpreter for the job interview? Well, first, it's unlikely that the applicant knows sign language. Hard of hearing people generally don't know sign language. Sign language is known by people who are deaf. Second, the accommodation that this person may request at the interview could be a quiet room or for the interviewer to always face the applicant when speaking. Easy enough for any employer to provide. Those, that's a reasonable accommodation. Now, I'm going to illustrate the wide range of workplace changes that fall under the label reasonable accommodation by describing scenes from a training video on disability and employment that I saw more than 20 years ago. But the acting, the writing, and the production values were all high caliber. The video had several employment scenarios. Each scenario had two scenes. One scene dramatized a problem, and the second showed a successful outcome. And success came through accommodations that were either low cost or no cost at all. Now, in the first scenario, a blind applicant comes in for a job interview and sits down. And the interviewer has on her face a look of concern. It's a look that says, what am I going to do with this situation? Well, fortunately, in this scenario, the job interviewer gets, remains her calmness and proceeds with the interview as she would with any other applicant and starts asking about the person's background, skills, and experience. The blind person very confidently describes how they've done the same work in previous job situations, describes the equipment that they use, the adaptive equipment that they use, and gradually the interviewer gets calm, more and more calm. In the second scene, we see the blind applicant now on the job at a work cubicle, and he's talking directly into the camera, and he says, basically, fortunately, the job interviewer saw beyond my disability and treated me like any other employee or job applicant, and I got the job because I could do the work. The second scenario, 
the scene takes place in a warehouse <clears throat> where there are racks of oh, various l large electronic devices and equipment. In this scene, the uh, supervisor is talking to a person who is apparently a new hire. The supervisor looks happy. His face, facial expression, his body language are very positive. And he's saying, oh, I, to the, uh, the new hire, I've read your resume. You've got just the kind of experience and skills that we need for this electronic repair position. Do you have any questions? And the new hire says, well, I have one. Uh, how heavy are the uh, electronic components that I'll be lifting and carrying? Well, immediately the supervisor's face gets a little defensive. And he says, oh, well, between some of them will be hanging between 40 and 50 pounds. The new hire says, oh, that's going to be a problem. I've had some back surgery in the past. And while I can lift a lot of weight, my doctor doesn't want, want me to carry anything beyond or heavier than 30 pounds. Well, the supervis supervisor's face mm, looks very grim. He says, oh, we have a problem here. Next scene shows the uh, new hire at a workbench working on electronic components. He speaks into the camera and says, well, fortunately, I got the job. We decided that all I would need would be a small cart on wheels. I would roll over to the racks where all the uh, electronic equipment that needs to be repaired is stacked, pull out the equipment, put it on the cart, roll it to my bench, slide it to my work bench, fix it, put it back on the cart, roll the cart to the rack, and lift it back onto the rack, which I can do. And then he said something like, and by the way, other employees think that using a cart is a good idea also because it saves on their back. And of course, that reduces on-the-job injuries and helps to keep workers' compensation costs low. I'm afraid we're getting close to the end of our time together, so I'm going to have to continue with the other scenarios at our next meeting. But I'd like to uh, remind everybody about the uh, uh, email number that you can use to send in comments or questions. It's accessforall at yahoo.com. And as always, please tell your friends, neighbors, and colleagues about Access for All. Everyone should be interested in the ADA because hardly anyone goes through life without a temporary or permanent experience with disability. In fact, it is appropriate to refer to people who do not have a disability today as temporarily able-bodied, T-A-B, TAB for short. Until the next program, I wish all people with disabilities and all TABs well, and let's all look forward to the day when the Pledge of Allegiance concludes with liberty, justice, and access for all. <laughs>